So, Dr. Crawford, you, you really had this wonderful piece that, that you wrote recently talking about all the therapeutics and overview, and I think it was very well received by the urology community. Just from your perspectives, give us your thoughts on uh, the role of immunotherapy, how that, how that is going to be used, especially since it, the NCCN guideline does recommend that immunotherapy really be the first line uh, choice of treatment for the minimally or asymptomatic CRPC patient. Where you think, you know, your, your views on immunotherapy and, and your perspectives in terms of all the advanced therapeutics that are going to be available. My view on uh, immunotherapy, if we take the NCCN guidelines, uh, and they are guidelines, and they're by a comprehensive cancer network, so it doesn't necessarily have large practice groups in it and private practice. Uh, they don't necessarily rely on level one evidence, um, and if they tried to, there would be a lot missing in this disease. Um, they they kind of say when you, you get to the castrate-resistant uh, standpoint, uh, point in the disease, and you have metastatic disease, that if you're in the kind of in the category of asymptomatic, minimally symptomatic, uh, the foundation should be sipilucil T. And I agree. Uh, it, it's a unique, it's not chemotherapy, it's well tolerated, and it's something that carries through the whole uh, treatment. So it, 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 and even, even if patients had minimal symptoms, uh, you know, that it's kind of broadened how to use it. What if somebody had chemotherapy, they responded, and they were back to it, could you use sipilucil T? Yeah. So I think it really should be part of the foundation. Uh, you mentioned uh, the article we did in oncology on sequencing these drugs just recently. It was uh, kind of fun to do that because we had a, a poetic license to kind of say what we felt um, in this journal, and they were very nice to, to, to listen to it. Um, there is, as Neil said, there are a number of new drugs out, and if we look at them, uh, we had, you'd mentioned chemotherapy. We talk, uh, you talked about uh, uh, the uh, cabazitaxel, but uh, so what's what's unique? We have we have an immunotherapy provenge. Uh, we have a new radiopharmaceutical called radium two twenty three, which is going to be a game changer too. We're all used to samarium and strontium, and they have a lot of baggage. Um, we've got a, a super anti-androgen MDV thirty one hundred. We've got a drug that's approved, abiraterone, which is, and these all work through different mechanisms. Uh, we have denosumab, and we have more coming, TAC-700, uh, Viamet has a 1720 lyase inhibitor. But they're not that all complicated. I mean, they're to, they're, these are all things that can be in the hands of urologists. So what I see happening is that the paradigm's going to shift if we play the game. Uh, is that if you ask a patient, what would you rather have, chemotherapy or, an, or a abiraterone or something like that, denosumab, provens, what are they going to say? I mean, most of them will say, hey, I'd rather have that. So I see that we, we fought for years about getting these patients to see the medical oncologist to get chemotherapy. And it was very disappointing that many times we got them there and the medical oncologist would say, well, let's wait till they're circling the drain a little bit more. Uh, before they would give the chemotherapy, and maybe that was right. So now we have drugs that are being studied and moved up, and are going to. There are patients, and they're not that hard to give. And, and so I think we have to, we have to embrace it. We've got to understand. I mean, it's not simple. Denosumab is a rank ligand inhibitor. It works on bone. There's some data about preventing bone nets. So we know what abiraterone does. We know what we're all familiar with antiandrogens. Um, we have radium-223, and we have provenge and things like that. So I think it's changing. Uh, we, need, we need to be involved, and I think the paradigm shift is going to be major, major that urologists are going to be involved in the treatment of these people if they play the game and understand and, and that. The other thing is, uh, and you mentioned this, Neil, about recognizing, and you said, what, uh, uh, Raul, what do you do in your clinic uh, uh, to recognize people that might be candidates for these drugs. Um, in this month's Journal of Urology, was a very nice article from the Zibotitan study that showed that uh, almost 35 to 40 percent of patients who were thought to be candidates because they didn't have metastatic disease had positive bone scans. You can have a positive bone scan with a PSA of 4 just as well as you do with 30. And as a matter of fact, uh, over half the people who have positive bone scans that are PSAs of less than 10. We've got to start thinking about it. Bone disease, metastatic disease, is a seminal event. And uh, it's not only you know, for the disease, but for the patient. 
and this is where the, the territory of a lot of these drugs, and uh, it's exciting to think, okay, how are we going to sequence these, but even more so, there's, there's a lot of reason to, to synergize the use of MDV3100 and zalutamide with abiraterone. You, you know, those two together, if you look at it, may be even more powerful than either one alone, and that studies like that are happening right now and will be game changers. David, I think you're right. I think between what you have just said, and again, I, I think many of us believe that it is, the, it is going to be up to the urologist to embrace this. And I'm a big believer and a physician champion, and I think what's the beauty about all these therapeutics, as Neil said very early on in this discussion, is that with the, def with the different mechanisms of actions of all these agents, that hopefully within our lifetime we can potentially make advanced prostate cancer a chronic disease.